Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the PCC service today. It's an honor to be with you today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Emma. And yes, I do have a little bit of an accent. I am from Sydney, Australia, now living in beautiful South Florida. And I am actually Pastor Gary's cousin. I know most of you would have picked that because we look so similar. But in case you didn't, I am actually Pastor Gary's cousin. And it's an honor to be with you today. So I know we are in this series called In Your Mind, and today Pastor Gary has asked me to share with you specifically on the topic of dealing with depression. So why don't we open in prayer? Lord, I just thank you that you are here today. God, I just lift up every person watching this, wherever they are listening to this. God, I just pray that you would give them a peace that surpasses understanding and a joy from heaven in their spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I stand before you today in a place of full buoyancy, mentally, uh, spiritually, emotionally, but it hasn't always been that way. And I'm going to unpack a little bit of that for you this morning, and we're going to have a look at some different uh, causes of depression, some different antidotes, and I'm going to share some things with you that I've learned over my journey, over years of talking with different counsellors, psychologists, doctors, and digging deep into the Word of God to see what Jesus has to say about this topic called depression. And I hope that some of the things I'm going to share with you today are going to help you in your journey or help you help those in your world. And I do want to say that sometimes we are treating it incorrectly because we don't know the cause. And I do want to say today that it's actually not a one-size-fits-all solution, but there is one God who has all the solutions. Amen? It's not a one-size-fits-all solution, but there is one God who has all the solutions this side of heaven. And if you're watching today and maybe you personally uh, don't personally feel like you struggle with depression or symptoms of depression or suicidal thoughts, anything in that category, but there will be at some point, if there isn't now, people in your world that do. And I, uh, my prayer this morning is that this would equip you to be able to help them, to be able to represent Jesus to them and help them the best way that you possibly can. Amen. So a little bit of my journey when it comes to um, mental health. You know, I was very young when I had first had thoughts of wanting to die, of suicidal thoughts. I actually don't ever remember not having these kinds of thoughts. Uh, my mum died when I was four years old. My oldest sister had already passed away. And my youngest sister is severely, severely disabled. And as a young child, overhearing conversations, I was just very aware that she had already outlived her life expectancy. And she still has because she's still alive today and she's 36 years old. Um, but I was just very aware of this and I shared a room with her growing up and, and I remember thinking, man, like any, I would pray for her every single night and I, I remember thinking each morning when I woke up, you know, she might not be with us anymore. I just didn't know. So I guess I was a little desensitized to this whole topic of death um, and I guess during my childhood, there were a lot of things that happened that really made me feel like I just remember always feeling like I was a nuisance, like it would just be better for everyone if I just wasn't around. You know, my mum had passed away, my dad remarried soon after, they had another baby, they had a church, there was a lot going on and uh, I was often babysat by a, a family in our church and the teenage son used to abuse me every single time and I remember just thinking, man, I wish I was just with my mum again and, and that was in heaven and it wasn't even a, I wasn't even aware that it was a particularly dark thing to think, I just thought I would just really would rather die. So <laughs> these thoughts, I know that sounds a little morbid, but that's just the way it was for me. And these thoughts and these feelings continued uh, all through my life, actually. And I remember being uh, 10 years old, around 10 years old, and being at a friend's house and we decided to, to write some poetry. I know this sounds a little bit random when I think of what my kids do now, but anyway, we didn't have iPads or <laughs> anything to do. And we used to write poems and write songs. It was just something we did for fun. And I remember um, her very excitingly, excitedly taking these uh, poems to her mom to read. And I even remember the line, <laughs> one of the lines from my poem, it said, um, maybe I should die tonight, maybe I should give up the fight, allow my myself to see the light. It rhymed beautifully, but clearly <laughs> it was very dark and morbid. And I remember her mom um, pulling down her glasses and looking at me and saying, Emma, you shouldn't be writing poems about dying. But the thing is, this is all I ever wrote about. And to be honest, it's what I often thought about. 
And I had no actually uh, awareness that this was not normal. It was just kind of this heavy um, blanket is probably the best way to describe it. This this heavy feeling uh, that was just with me everywhere I went. And I wasn't a particularly, um, you know, depressed uh, little girl. I, rem- I do have very good memories of my childhood as well. I was very shy. I never spoke up, which was obviously a problem. Um, but I had good memories as well. It was just this thing that kind of stayed with me. And it continued um, with me through my life. And, you know, sometimes it would get better. Sometimes it would be worse, depending on what was going on in my life. But I even remember um, when I broke up with my boyfriend, you know, my first relationship. And, and my first thought was, oh, man, I I just need to die. Like, what's the point? I just wish I could die. That was just my default. And I had never um, even considered having a different kind of default. So this kind of uh, continued on. And the worst that it actually got was when I was 30 years old. And I know most of you are thinking, isn't that just right now? But no, I'm actually <laughs> I'm actually 38 years old. I'm going to be 39 this year. Um, but I was 30 years old. I just had our second child. We have four children now. I just had our second child, Jeremiah. He was maybe six months old and I was back at work, working full time at a, a TV station in Sydney, Australia called Channel 10. I worked on a show called The Late News and I loved my job. I was so happy to be back at work. Um, Um, And I guess for me, it was kind of like the perfect storm. There were just things coming from from every single angle. And a real trigger for me was um, a conversation I had with someone who I just really respected, really looked up to, in hindsight, had given far too much authority into my world. And we'll save that for a topic on boundaries. But anyway, (laughs) he said some things to me that um, just really cut me to the core and just really uh, made me question, like, gosh, what am I even here for? Like, what's the point? Um, and it was a bit of a trigger for me to, to really go on a bit of a downward spiral, managing, you know, two babies under two and a career. And, and at this time, you know, I was actually very involved in church. I was preaching. <laughs> I knew all the scriptures. I take every thought captive and turn it to the obedience of Christ. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. But I was fighting this battle. And, and some days I was winning and some days I wasn't. But you know what? When you get up and you're fighting a battle every single day, it can get really, really exhausting. And I was at work and uh, this one afternoon, our main anchor, our main journalist who presented the news just didn't show up for work. She wasn't even 30 yet. She was a very successful woman. Um, someone who I really looked up to and had gleaned from. And, and working in a newsroom, you know, we get all the emergency calls. We hear all the police radio, the ambulance radio, that kind of stuff, because if it sounds interesting, we want to get our cameras down there. That's kind of how it works. <laughs> um, and we had a call through and a body had been found at the bottom of a cliff in Australia called The Gap, which is uh, a very common place where people jump and take their lives. And it was her. And she just didn't show up for work that day. And again, for me, that was another trigger. And uh, I remember one night I was driving home. And at this point, I had started to do some things to um, kind of prepare my family if I didn't make it. Um, I had started to kind of get all our affairs in order. I did all of our banking accounts. I made sure my husband um, was on all our accounts. I emailed him all the details so he would have them. I did things like I mentioned to him, you know, I really love uh, my wedding dress to be saved for Hosanna, my daughter. And I told him where it was. And I remember him looking at me like, yeah, cool. (laughs) You can give it to her. (laughs) Um, You know, obviously not thinking too much of it. But the back of my mind, I was just trying to think, how can I make it as easy as I can for everybody? Because I felt like my existence was just a nuisance. I was just a nuisance. So fast forward and I'm driving home one night from work and um, I would often have to fight the urge to put my car into oncoming traffic at this particular place, um, this particular strip where I drive home on a highway, but it's just two lanes. And I worked on the late news, so I'd be driving home very late at night. And every every time it would be like a battle within myself and I'd put my worship music on and I'd grip that steering wheel and I'd just be praying, come on, like, come on, Jesus, get me home. And this night, uh, with everything that was going on, I was just done. I was just so exhausted. And I remember just thinking, okay, Emma, you can do this. Like, you can put your car into the 
the oncoming traffic. Just wait till there's a big truck. Like, you can do this. And I even remember, because I had the fear started to rise up. Like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And I remember thinking of it like when I went skydiving, which I did once, and I don't recommend it, by the way. Traumatizing. Um, <laughs> but I remember that feeling of, okay, fear, and then just push through the fear and jump. And I'm gripping that steering wheel, and I just started to count down. Okay, three, two, one. And if you want to know what happened next, you're going to have to stay till the end of the message because I'm going to tell you what happened at the end of the message. But I tell you a, a little bit of my journey and story in this area because we are in a fight. And if you're watching today and, uh, you know, you... I just want you to know that if you have feelings of depression, uh, they don't always progress to suicidal thoughts. And if you have a symptom of depression, it doesn't mean that you have depression. It just uh, is an indicator that you need to make some conscious choices to do things a little bit differently, to keep yourself healthy emotionally and mentally. And I'm going to tell you a few things today that are going to help you. Suicide is a, a permanent, irreversible attempt to solve a temporary problem. It's a permanent, irreversible effect to solve what is a temporary problem. And do you want to know how many people actually make that choice? Choose that as their solution? A million people worldwide, 40,000 this year alone, 110 people a day here in America. It is the number one killer of kids here in the US between the ages of 15 and 24. It's double the murder rate here in the US. And I can tell you, people don't actually want to die. They are just exhausted from the mental fight. They're just exhausted from the mental fight. And if you're watching here today and you're, you're struggling with any of these thoughts or feelings, you know, I came here today to tell you that I stand before you alive and well. And the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in me. And the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you. And because of that, you can be free. You can be healthy. You can be whole. And you can overcome any thoughts of depression, of suicide, of anxiety, of fear in the name of Jesus. That same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in me and lives in you. And we all have full access. Amen. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 4, 8, it says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but we are not in despair. Look at the life of Paul. You know, Paul really didn't have much of a reason to have a good day. <laughs> there was a lot of stuff going on around him that... Uh, it wasn't great. You know, he got shipwrecked. Nobody rescued him. He finally climbs up upon an island. A snake bites him on the ankle, random. Um, he's, um, he gets, so in the Bible, it talks about 40 lashes that would kill you. He got 39 lashes. How, how nice of them to spare him. 39 lashes five times. He was beaten with rods. He was stoned. And no, not recreationally. I know some of you are thinking, oh, he was stoned. Finally, he got some relief. But no, he was buried up to his neck and they threw rocks at his head. <laughs> but everywhere, he keeps saying, I've got the victory. I've got the victory. I'm hard pressed on every side, but I am not in despair. How did Paul do this? He made some radical, radical choices. And he fought for his joy. He made some radical choices and he fought for his joy. In 2 Corinthians 6.10, he writes, Sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing yet possessing everything. And I just want to give you some things today that I don't want you just to hear these things. I want you to actually uh, take action I want you to start doing some things. I don't just want you to hear these things. I want you to start doing some things. So get your pen, get your paper and write some things down because uh, no takers are history makers. Don't use your iPhone because you're going to get distracted. <laughs> so we are destined to reign on this earth through the power of Jesus Christ. And to reign means to exercise kingly power over something. In Acts 10.38, it says, Jesus of Nazareth, with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed. Healing all who were oppressed. And that same power that was alive then is alive today and is available for you and for me. Amen. Jesus knew uh, what we would be going through. 
He knew what we would be facing in years to come and he made sure that we would not be caught off guard. Depression actually is not a new thing. We've just forgotten old truths. Elijah got so depressed that he wanted to die. Gideon's self-worth was so low that he didn't recognize that he was a mighty man of valor. God God has answers for us this side of heaven. You know, when we look into the Bible, Proverbs 12.25, it says, Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers us up. Psalm 119.25, the message version, I love this. It's David's crying out. He's actually writing a song, <laughs> just like I did. And he says, I'm feeling terrible. I couldn't feel worse. Get me on my feet again. You promised me, remember? I love that. He cries out to God. You promised me, remember? I think that God... Um, leaves all these scriptures in the Bible so we have somewhere to look to see how these mighty men and women of God overcame and overcame this side of heaven. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought and turn it to the obedience of Christ. Jesus knew what we would be going through and he made sure that we would not be caught off guard. It's actually not a new thing. We've just forgotten old truths. Our lives are directly affected by the way we think. Our lives are affected and directed by the way we think. So many uh, I see, they, they get saved or come into relationship with Jesus, however you like to refer to it. They meet, hello, the creator, <laughs> their creator, but they don't actually change the way that they think and they wonder why they're still struggling with the same things. Our lives are affected and directed by the way that we think. And I highly recommend a great book by uh, Dr. Caroline Leaf. I had the honor of sitting down and interviewing her and picking her brain, ironically, uh, on her book called Rewire Your Brain. And she is a neuroscientist. She's done amazing work on researching this amazing thing called the brain. And she loves Jesus. She knows the word of God. And and, uh, I highly recommend you read some of her work. And I just want to uh, break down just really quickly for you the, f- the four main causes of depression and four corresponding antidotes. Four causes and four corresponding antidotes. And there are some things that are going to help with whatever the cause of of what you're feeling is. And those things are things like diet. You would be surprised. What you put in your body does affect your brain, your mind, how you think, your emotions. Uh, Things like exercise, harvesting those happy hormones. Amen. (laughs) Things like how much sleep you're getting. Uh, Things like thinking about what you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. Switching on your brain. Switching on your brain. So uh, four causes of depression and four corresponding antidotes. The first one is the chemical cause. And this could be, um, you know, a genetic predisposition. Uh, It could be from substance abuse, change of life, pregnancy, chronic fatigue, just to name a few. And the antidote for that is some of the things I just mentioned, uh, looking at what you're eating, um, getting outside in the fresh air, exercising. And you might think, I don't have time to go to the gym, Emma. <laughs> well, neither do I. But you can do it at home 15 minutes every morning. Just harvest those happy hormones every single morning. 15 minutes in your room, 50 sit-ups, 50 push-ups. Come on. Seeing a, a medical professional, seeing a medical perfec- professional and correct medication the right solution. And yes, I do think mental health drugs are suitable for certain people. And no, it's not a lack of faith. If someone is suffering from depression and it's a chemical cause, please don't just tell them to read their Bible and pray. I have known too many people that have not gone to get professional help because they were so worried that they didn't want to be on any kind of medication. What would people think? They they cared too much what people thought. They didn't go and get the help. And then they're not actually here today. And has the pendulum swung too far? Possibly. But I personally would rather that than the alternative. So go and see a medical professional and get some medical help. The second cause is cognitive cause, the cognitive cause. And the antidote is established negative thought patterns that need to be deconstructed and create healthy strongholds to rewire your brain. Like Dr. Caroline Leaf talks about in her book, like uh, Pastor Stephen Furtick and Crash the Chatterbox, rewire the way you think. 
It will take you to a place of higher strength in cognitive thinking, higher strength in cognitive thinking. Maybe you were raised in a very negative environment. You may be always told when you were a kid that you know, you're not worth anything, you really shouldn't be here. Um, you're a disappointment. We have to be strong enough to be able to reject rejection. <laughs> We need to be strong enough to be able to reject rejection. When someone rejects you, it's just an opportunity for an upgrade. Amen? It's just an opportunity for an upgrade. And the cure for a cognitive source is to rewire your brain. Work on your most valuable asset, which is your mind. Amen? And get it to a place where you are strong enough to stare adversity in the face. Get it to a place where you are strong enough to stare adversity in the face. The third is our circumstances cause. Um, simple everyday events that are intensely negative. You work hard, you find out that you lose your job, you're driving home, your car breaks down. Um, you get home, your, car, your house has been broken into and every, everything's gone. Uh, just continual circumstances multiple circumstances at once. And the antidote is to dig into the word of God, fighting the good fight. The qualities of self-control and perseverance will get you through. You can do this. And there, there are some uh, circumstances, maybe there's some things going on in your world right now. And if you just surround yourself with worship, become very aware of what you're allowing into your body, what you're watching on TV. Don't watch a horrible murder movie. Watch a comedy that's going to make you laugh. You are the, the thermostat in your home. You're not the thermometer. You set the tone. You put the worship music on. You, you, allow what you, you decide what you're going to allow into your home and not into your home. And uh, you know what? If you say to me, Emma, I am just so exhausted from this fight. Like, I can't even pray anymore. I've had a lot of people say that to me. I can't even pray anymore. Can I just encourage you? Just put some worship music on. Just allow the presence of the Holy Spirit to fill the room, to wash over you, his healing balm to wash over you. And, you know, if you pray in tongues, pray in tongues. Just let deep cry out to deep. Isaiah 61 says, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. Speak it out every single day. You're going to have to put in some effort. <laughs> I had to put in some effort, but it's going to be worth it, and it's going to set you up for a great future. Amen? And the fourth cause is spiritual oppression spiritual oppression. One thing I've discovered is there is such a thing as a spiritual assignment against someone's life. And Matthew 18, 18 says, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Exercise kingdom authority over that spirit. Boldly confront this spirit. Every place light enters, darkness has no choice but to flee. Become aware and educate yourself and get into the word of your authority in Christ and the authority that you have. Trust me, the devil cannot handle the name of Jesus. Amen? So let me tell you the rest of my story. So there I am driving home that night and I am convincing myself, okay, you can do this, Emma. Like you can put your car into that oncoming track. You can do it. And I'm psyching myself up. I'm thinking back to when I went skydiving. I'm like, feel the fear and just do it anyway. Come on. <laughs> and I'm counting down and my, my hands were gripping the steering wheel and I was counting down three, two, one. And as I went to turn my steering wheel, an overwhelming shout rose up from the pit of my stomach. It was almost involuntary. And I started screaming at the top of my lungs, I will not die, devil. I will live. I will not die. I will live. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. I started declaring scripture. I started shouting out the name of Jesus. And then I started singing worship at the top of my lungs. And you know what? It was like my mind and my body had called it a day, but my spirit just had a little, just a little fight left and it was going to rise up with all that it had. And I literally heard the, the tangible growl of darkness. I remember it so clearly right here. And as I continued to speak it out, to speak out, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. I take every thought captive. 
I turn it to the obedience of Christ. I will not die, devil. I will live. Let me tell you, every place light enters. Darkness has no choice but to flee. And I heard the growl of darkness get quieter and quieter and quieter as I started to sing worship at the top of my lungs. I was singing out that worship at the top of my lungs. And I gripped that steering wheel and I drove all the way home screaming out that worship, crying my eyes out. And I remember walking in and my poor husband was probably thinking, what in the world is going on? But you know what? Something broke in the spiritual realm that night. Something broke. And I would like to say I woke up the next morning and, oh my gosh, I'm free. (laughs) But it didn't quite happen like that. But something had shifted. Something had shifted. I had found some hope. I had found some hope. And, uh, you know, Hebrews 6.19 says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary where our forerunner Jesus has already entered on our behalf. We have this hope. And, you know, biblical hope, it's a confident expectation. It's not like, cross your fingers, I hope it doesn't rain today. It means expect great things from God. And I woke up the next morning with some hope in my spirit, some hope in my spirit. We all have this survival instinct on the inside of us. It's how God made us to fight and he made us to conquer. He made us to conquer. And in my moment of need, the Holy Spirit rose up on the inside of me. And um, you know what? You might be listening today and you might be thinking, I know exactly the scenario that you're describing. But I don't have any energy left. I don't have any fight left. Let me tell you, there are are people fighting for you right now. There are people fighting for you right now. And we need people who will rise up and point their finger on behalf of someone else and stand up and say, in the name of Jesus, you spirit of suicide, you get off her life, you get off his life. We need people who will rise up and stand in the gap. Having done all there is to stand, continue to stand and fight for those. Fight for those. Perhaps what's going to deliver you, the anointing that's going to come and destroy that yoke and take off that oppression is going to come through the spiritual authority of a man or a woman of God who is free. And they're going to exercise that authority and they're going to fight on your behalf. And that thing is going to go in the name of Jesus. Maybe you're watching today and you don't personally uh, you personally haven't experienced some of the things that I've shared today. But you possibly do have someone in your life who does, and if you haven't, you will at some point. Because depression is the number one health problem in the world. One out of five people either are on antidepressants now or will be at some point. And maybe today God is calling you to intercede and to fight for those in your world, to stand in the gap for them and fight in the spiritual realm. So I just want to, as we come to an end, just give you five things uh, that really helped me. And these things I was already doing and I continued to do them very intentionally after that night. And they really helped me find healing. And number one is um, pour your heart, heart out to God. Pour your heart out to God. God invites you to healing. He says, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. And this is not just for the body, it's for the soul as well. And trust me, he can handle it. If he can handle me, he can handle you. (laughs) Pull your heart out to God. And then number two is um, speak out the word of God. Write it on your mirror. Read it out loud every morning when you get ready, when you brush your teeth. I am more than a conqueror. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Write it on post-it notes around your car, everywhere. Surround yourself with the word of God. Number three, get healthy physically. It will help you. Try and do some kind of exercise every single day. Harvest those happy hormones. Amen. You'll be surprised how much this will help you. Number four. Get a vision bigger than what you're facing. Get a vision bigger than what you're facing. Find somewhere you can serve. Get, put pen to paper. Get a blank piece of paper and think, okay, if money wasn't an option, if time wasn't an option, uh, what would I do? Start to dream again. And you know what? If you're like, I ain't, I, I ain't got no vision, Emma, <laughs> find someone else who does and serve their vision. Trust me, there are a lot of people with big visions. Find someone else who does and serve their vision. Find a vision bigger than what you're facing. And number five, 
please go and see a great counsellor. Go and see a medical professional and talk to them about what you're feeling. And as I close today, I just want to take a minute to pray for every single person watching this. You know, the Bible says that we have to put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. It tells us to put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So, so Jesus knew, God knew <laughs> that we would be facing this. And he tells us what to do. And uh, sometimes we need someone to help us get dressed. Amen. And I want to pray for you this morning. And I just want to help you put on that garment of praise for that spirit of heaviness. So I just want to pray right now. If that's you, if you're watching this and, and you're feeling that today and you can relate to some of the things that I've shared. Thank you, Jesus, that you are here. I thank you for every single person watching this or listening to this right now. God, I thank you that you are right there next to them. I thank you that you know the details and you care about the details. Lord, I thank you for your word, Luke 137, that says nothing is impossible with God. And I just break the spirit of depression. I break the spirit of suicidal thoughts off their life right now in the name of Jesus. God, I just pray for your spirit of joy just to fill their home, fill their heart. God, a peace that surpasses understanding. God, a joy that comes from heaven would fill them right now from the tip of their head to the bottom of their toes. And God, I pray for those people that are watching that may have people in their world, their mom, their dad, their husband, wife, child, friend, and they just don't know how to help them. God, I pray that you would just equip them. I pray that you would give them strategy. I pray that they would represent you. And I pray that you would um, help them rise up and stand in the gap for those in their world. That they would rise up with the authority of Jesus Christ on the inside of them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, that you are here. God, I just pray for an injection of hope, an injection of hope into every single person listening, this, listening to this, watching this, an injection of hope, Jesus. And, you know, you might be watching this today and you might be thinking, I don't really know where I'm at with God. <laughs> maybe you don't know where you are. Maybe you knew him at one point. Maybe you've never really thought of uh, having a relationship with him. Can I just tell you, He wants to have a relationship with you today. And He knows all the details. He knows everything that's going on. And He's not scared of the details. He's not scared of your story. Nothing is impossible for Him. He even, He writes it multiple times in His Word. Luke 1 37, nothing is impossible with God. And He wants to come into relationship with you today. He wants to hear your heart. He wants to know you intimately. And as we take steps towards Him, He runs towards us. His heart is for us. And if that's you, I just want to pray a prayer and you can pray it along with me. God, I just thank you that you died for me. I thank you that you love me, Jesus. God, I make a decision today to invite you into my heart. God, I choose today to put you first. God, I turn from the way that I was going. I repent and I do a 180 and I choose to follow you. I choose to put you first in my decisions. God, I choose to seek you first. I commit my life to you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I encourage you just to get in touch with PCC. Their contact details will be here on this video. And if you know someone in your world who you know even if you just suspect that maybe they're struggling with any kind of depression or, or thoughts that are not of God, can I just encourage you to share this video with them? Don't be shy, just share it with them. And uh, I just pray that you would be able to represent Jesus to them and love them. Amen. Amen. Thanks for having me.